Thank you, Pastor Riday, for the honor of speaking in your pulpit today in the International Church. It's wonderful to be in Hong Kong again. And thank you to uh, Curtis Silcox and the ministry that he has had for so many years here, his faithfulness. And uh, he's truly a man of God, a man of distinction, and, and uh, we love him and appreciate him. And DJ and Lauren, boy, we miss them. You got them, and now we don't have them anymore. But, they, but you love them, and you're taking good care of them. And that's what I'm thankful for. And Julie, she's such a sweet young lady, and we're just praying for a miracle for her. Amen? Amen. So it's a privilege to be back in China and Hong Kong. Uh, Kathy and I have been a number of times, and the last trip was a couple of years ago. Uh, but we have been coming here since I think about 1990 that we have made trips, a number of trips to the mainland or to Hong Kong and uh, helping churches, helping pastors, coming alongside, encouraging and uh, giving materials to help train leaders and that sort of thing. We love the country. I have to admit, I think I have left a piece of my heart back here every time that we've come. Uh, something, uh, just uh, the love of God for this nation, uh, for the people. And, um, and I'm honored that we could be here. We've been in the large cities, Beijing and Hong Kong and uh, uh, Shanghai and Wuhan and so forth. We've sailed the Yance River from one end to the other and uh, right to the, where the dam is. But I have to tell you, the most, and the countryside is beautiful. There's so many beautiful places in China. But I have to tell you the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in China are the faces of the people of God, the brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. That, to me, is the most beautiful thing. And uh, so I'm looking at beautiful faces this morning. Turn to somebody and say, you're really, you're really beautiful. Just go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't know if the guys will appreciate that as much, but they're handsome anyway. You know, there's uh, one of the things that Kathy and I, my wife and I, I wish she could be here with me because honestly, she is so much my better half and I wish you could meet her. But um, we've been in 45, I think 45 or 46 different nations of the world preaching the gospel and ministering and all different languages and different backgrounds. But you know what the thing I've discovered is that there is one word that every nation, every culture, every language, there's one word that is the same everywhere. That word is hallelujah. Amen. Come on, say it with me. Hallelujah. hallelujah. One more time. Hallelujah. hallelujah. That's a great and wonderful word of praise to the Lord, and it's the same in virtually every other language. They may pronounce it just a little differently, but it's the same. I understand that many of you are Filipino. How many of you are Filipino? Oh, wow. Oh, I wish I could greet you. I can't remember the greeting in Tagalog. Uh, I wish I could remember, but uh, I, uh, part of my heart is also in the Philippines. We, we have a spiritual son, Paul Mazaredo, who is uh, there in the Philippines, and he graduated along with my son. We raised him for some of his life and then sent him, launched him back into the Philippines. He is now pastor over five, I think last time I counted with him, was five churches. And uh, I, I miss seeing him and uh, love him very much. But we, we love the Philippines. We love Quezon City, where, um, where he is from, and of course, uh, right near Manila there. But uh, we have a, how many know, we have a big family of God. And I don't know about you, but I have found that sometimes my brothers and sisters in the Lord are actually closer to me than even some of the family that is blood relatives. You know what, how many know what I'm talking about? There's a, there's a bond between us. I mean, I, I, I've only met you today and I already sense the warmth from you and I feel like you're my brothers and my sisters. We know each other. Because we have history together in Jesus. And uh, when the family, you know, the church is about family. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the generations of time. 
And uh, how many know when the family is working well, it is wonderful? Yes. How many know when the family is not working well, it's terrible? Yes. And, it, and whether we're talking about families, nuclear families of uh, our, our children and grandparents and all of that, or whether we are talking about the family of God, it's the same thing. And so the title of my message this morning, and they're going to help me back there, and I so appreciate those guys. Thank you. And I, they, they have no idea what I'm going to say. They're just going to try to, you know, put their seatbelt on and go with me. But uh, I gave to them a PowerPoint because I like images to help you remember. And I like so that you can see some outlines so it, it will help you to grasp and put something in your heart long after I'm gone and you've forgotten who I am, I hope you remember the word that I'm going to give to you this morning because it is a word from the Lord. And uh, I have prayed for you even before I knew you. And I want you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. The title of the message is Faith from Generation to Generation. And it's a familiar passage of scripture that many of you probably know well enough to quote. Uh, at least some of it. It is a passage about faith and responsibility. Faith that is handed down from generation to generation. But the importance of our guarding that faith, how that faith is maintained and how it is lost from generation to generation. So Stand with me in honor of God's word. Would you just stand please with me as we read these words from Joshua. And I'm going to read the first part. But when we get to the end of this, I'm going to ask you to join me in reading aloud the words of Joshua. Beginning at verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Now join me in reading Joshua's words together. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say it again. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Lord. Heavenly Father, release the power of your word over this room right now in Jesus' name. Loose the word to do its work in our hearts and bind the devil with it. In Jesus' name, I pray that you would penetrate every heart in this place. And may the overflow of grace flow out of this building and onto the streets of Hong Kong and touch the generations for Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you just tell somebody, it's going to be a bad day for the devil. Just, just let them know right now, it's going to be a bad day for the devil. Thank you. One of my mentors in my early years of ministry, probably the most influential man in my early life, was Pastor Bond P. Bowman. He pastored a great church called the Brightmore Tabernacle in Detroit, Michigan. Still a great church today. He was a man that pastored for 44 years. He, my wife and I were married in that church. My wife was raised in that church and m much of my life was also there. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But he was a great man. He, he was a man of whom you would say he did it right. Never had a uh, moral failure or any of the in the 44 years always operated with integrity he left a wonderful spiritual inheritance that church is still there to this day a great church and yet there was one deep pain in his heart and his life and later when I had the privilege of being on his staff when he invited me to come back after some evangelistic ministry that I was involved in by the way the per people who wrote Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. I traveled with them for five years. So, Bruce Thumb. Yeah, yeah I traveled with them for five years. And it's a great, great and powerful ministry. Thousands and thousands have come to Christ through it. 
But after I traveled in evangelistic work for five years, Pastor Bowman invited me to come and serve on his staff. And for whatever reason, God blessed me with his trust. He would sit and open his heart to me, probably things that he didn't share with just anyone. And the thing that would pain his heart, it was not the challenge of a big church. Back in those days, it would have been considered a mega church. Um, it wasn't the challenge of the staff and all the other things that pastors deal with. But the thing that pained his heart most, that grieved him, and I would watch him cry as he would talk about it, was that one of his children, his son, was not serving the Lord. And it would break his heart. And he would look at me and he'd say through tears, Wayne, whatever you do, don't save the world and lose your family. And so down through the years, though I confess there probably been some noble causes that I may have neglected my wife or my kids from time to time, but generally I would say that I listened and I responded and I obeyed his admonishment to me on that day when he told me that. Because I can't imagine the pain if my children or my grandchildren did, did not know God and did not have an experience with the Lord. And yet it happens. In fact, I want to say it happens not just in good families. It happens in great families. Pastor Bowman was not just a good man. He was a man that I would say was a great man. And yet in his family, his one son out of four children was not serving the Lord. And it was so painful. So the question is this today. How do, we, how do we respond in such a way that we continue the blessings of God from generation to generation to generation rather than seeing the enemy wrap its chains of iniquity around the family tree and squeeze the life out of, the, out of that family? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can expose the works of darkness for what it is. And the Bible is careful to give to us his words of warning that expose, in fact, those, that darkness and the schemes of the devil. For example, Ephesians chapter 6, 11 says, we should understand and firmly resist the schemes of the devil. Or in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, we should not be ignorant of his schemes. And so the Lord is faithful to expose those schemes and to reveal this pattern of how faith can decline from generation to generation. This downward gravitational pull from generation to generation. And so my outline is very simple. Though the message is profound from God's word. The outline is, number one, God's the pattern of declining faith that God reveals. The second, the second principle is God's plan to perpetuate the faith. And so I, this is very personal. I want this to be personal to you. Because this is about you. It is about your children. It is about your grandchildren. It's about your parents. It's about your grandparents. Listen, this is also about churches. It is about movements. It is about how great revivals that were once fanning the flames of the Holy Spirit across the world, how great revivals that once were tremendous in their influence become reduced to a mausoleum of dead bones celebrating a faith that no longer exists. That's what this is about. And so I'm using some object lessons this morning. If I knew you well enough, I'd probably draw some of you out and have you come and sit in these chairs, but you'd probably be scared. What is he going to do to me if I do that? <laughs> so I promise I won't do that, but there must be grandfathers in this room. Anybody grandfathers? Who's a grandfather? How about, uh, how, many, how many of you, uh, you are a son and you're a first generation believer? First generation believer. 
How many of you, your parents served the Lord? Let me just see. Your parents served the Lord. Okay. And uh, how many of you come from a line of Christians, maybe two or three or even four generations back? Put your hands up. All right. So there's a variety of generations in this room, but I want you to think about these three chairs. This chair, chair number one, you can't see it over there, but it's here. <laughs> this is generation number one. The second chair, this is generation number two. And this is generation number three. Now, I want you to think about your family. I want you to think about grandparents or parents. I want you to think about children and grandchildren. And maybe you could kind of put faces on these chairs that would represent your homes or your families. And I want you to think about the generations. Generation, say it with me. This is who? One. That's one. Who is this? Two. And this is generation number three. And God talks about these generations in His Scripture. And so let's go back now to Joshua chapter 24. And remembering these chairs, Joshua 24, we hear the, the words of a man who sits in the first chair. Moses has died now. John, Joshua now represents the first generation after Moses. He sits in the first chair. He's a first generation covenant man. You might say he's a first generation believer in God. In fact, in verse 15, when Joshua lifts his voice, what does he say? As for me and what? And my house, we will serve the Lord. In other words, when he says that, you know he says it with confidence. He doesn't say, as for me and my house, we're going to make some kind of an effort to try to serve the Lord. He doesn't say, if things don't go wrong, we are going to serve God. He stands and says, not just me, but even the second generation, my house, is going to serve the Lord. Joshua was a man who knew the Lord. He sits in this first chair and God used Joshua, speaks to Joshua. Joshua talks back to God. Read the number of times it says, and the word of the Lord came to Joshua. Or how many times Joshua said unto the Lord, or Joshua spoke to God. There's this dialogue between Joshua and God. In fact, he goes all the way, he would have gone right to the top of Mount Sinai when God was giving to Moses the revelation. And Moses held him back and said, no, you wait down here. You can't come all the way up into the glory of God. But you wait down here. He would have gone all the way into the presence of God. He was close to the Lord. He knew the Lord. But I want you to see something, a shift in language that is very subtle, but you'll see it in the scripture. It says in verse 31, Joshua, of course, had this personal relationship with God, sees mighty exploits in God's name. But look at verse 31 and see if you detect a little bit of a transition in the language. It says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. That's generation what? One. And all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. That's generation number two. And it says, and they had known, had known all the deeds of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now I want to ask you something. Is that present tense for the second generation, or is that past tense? It's past tense, isn't it? So Joshua knows the Lord. There he sits in first chair. Second generation, it says, they had known, they had known the deeds that the Lord had done for Israel. Do you see the change? Now, watch this. So Joshua knows the Lord in a personal way. He sits in the first chair. Second generation, they know of the Lord. They know of the deeds that the Lord has done. They know about God. But it's not the same. There's this pattern that starts to emerge. In fact, you'll see it in the history of God's dealings with his people. 
In Psalm 107 verse, or 103 verse 7, it says, God made known his ways to Moses and his acts or deeds to the sons of Israel. You see the difference? Moses knew God, but they knew of God by his acts and his deeds. Same parallel. Joshua knows the Lord. He knows the Lord personally so closely that he knows the ways of the Lord. Just like Moses, his predecessor, did. But generation one knows the Lord. The second generation knows of the Lord. Now watch this. Second generation now outlives Joshua. Now look at the third generation in Judges chapter 2. Just turn one or two pages forward in your Bible. And watch what happens. Joshua now has died. Back in verse 8, 110 years of age. And listen to the words in Judges chapter 2 verse 10. And all that generation, that's the second generation now. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them. What generation now? This is the third generation. Another generation who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. How many see the picture? First generation knows the Lord personally, intimately. It is a personal relationship with God. Second generation knows of the Lord, knows about God, knows the deeds that the Lord had done. Third generation doesn't know the Lord and doesn't even know the deeds that the Lord had done for Israel. So you can look at this in different ways. First generation knows the Lord, knows the ways of God. Second generation knows the works that the Lord had done. Third generation doesn't know the Lord or his works. You could say saved, backslidden, unsaved. I mean, there's different ways that you could look at this. But how many understand this is the downward spiral of faith that is lost from generation to generation. First generation, they know the God of miracles. Second generation knows about the miracles of God. The third generation doesn't know God or the miracles of the Lord. No mighty works. So this is, you could say it this way, committed. First chair, committed. Second chair, Compromise. Third chair, calloused. That is to say, they're ignorant of the things of God. They don't, they don't understand the things of the Lord. And so, by the way, the second chair, it's always been a puzzle to me. How is it that in the second chair, how is it the third chair, they don't even know about the works that God had done? And I thought about this, I thought, you know what, if you sat in the second chair, you know what you should be, but you're not there. When your children say to you, Mom, Dad, how come we don't pray like Grandma and Grandpa? How come we don't have faith? How come we don't see answers to prayer? You'd stop talking about the Lord too. And so there's conflict in this second chair. There's an identity crisis. Because you know what you should be, but you're not there. That's the second chair. And I'm not just talking about chronology here. I'm not just talking about age of people. I'm talking about a spiritual development. This is a spiritual chronology. And so, here's the way this works. This is a, let me give, let's try to make this a little more practical. About a hundred years ago, there was a family a family lineage. This is a real family. It's not just an illustration, but it's a real family. Family by the name of Burdett. And I've, I've, I know this history. I've read this history. I understand this. But here's the way it went. Early in the 20th century, young man, 19 years of age. His name is Roscoe Burdett. He falls in love with a young lady by the name of Viva Smith. She's 17. He's 19. They fall in love. They marry. And shortly after they get married, there is a revival that comes through that part of northern Missouri in the United States. It was sweeping west from Azusa Street and it was sweeping east 
from the East Coast, and it happened to be that a great revival broke out in that area. In a tent meeting, a man was preaching about God the Holy Spirit in a way that they'd never heard before. Well, both Roscoe and Viva, newly married, went to that tent meeting. They gave their heart to the Lord. And the result was the overflow of that grace and God's blessing in their life Family members started to see the change in their life. They started inviting their brothers and sisters and their friends. And then their family got saved and they started inviting. And from that tent meeting and those people who came to Christ, that was the nucleus of a brand new church that was started in northeast Missouri. So Roscoe and Viva are sitting in this first chair as first generation believers. They give birth to two children, Howard and Dorothy. And Howard and Dorothy grow up in that church and they see their parents serving God. And they watch as remarkable things that their parents tell them about. But what happens is they get their eyes off of the Lord and both of them compromise in their life. In fact, they, they didn't just see the church and all the great things, but how many understand there's some fractures and failures and how many know there, there might be some hypocrites in church? Yes. And so they get their eyes off of the Lord and they start seeing some of the things that are wrong. The result is both of them compromise. And so Dorothy, sitting in this chair, meets a handsome young soldier and falls in love with him. He's not a believer, but she falls in love with him and marries him. Out of that union, there are three boys that are born. And they now sit in chair number three. Now, they hear no prayers because Marvin, who is the man that Dorothy marries, wants nothing to do with anything religious. The only time these boys will ever hear the name of Jesus is when he gets mad enough to say the name. So there's no prayers at night before they go to bed. There's no prayers for, for meals or grace at the table for, in Thanksgiving for a meal. And so the only thing they ever hear is occasionally they hear Dorothy tell about what happened in her life when she was serving the Lord and with their grandparents. Let me ask you this. What do you think the chance of the boys sitting, those three boys sitting in chair number three, what do you think the chance is that they will serve the Lord? Very, very small chance that they will serve the Lord. Very small chance. Now, I'm going to leave the bird at lineage for a minute, and I'm going to come back. This is the way it happens in generations. And... One more thing I want to say about the first chair. The first chair believers are dead to self. I mean, they're just sold out for God. Anything, we just give it up for the Lord. You know, it's alive and dead to self, alive in Christ. And so they're absolutely certain about who they are in Christ. Second chair Christians, many times they're trying to find themselves. The Bible says, and a man who is double-minded is unstable in all his ways. And so they're trying to find themselves. We get into the third chair, and they're absorbed in self, and many times self-centered. Now, listen carefully. This is what happens in families, and this is what happens in churches. Because in the first chair church, there, people are always coming to Christ. People are always getting saved, and, and they focus on that. They just can't. People can't stop talking about Jesus because he's so wonderful in their life. And it attracts other people to their testimony and to who they are. And others want to be like that. They want to have the freedom. They want to have the change and the transformation that, somebody that, that they see in somebody's life. But in the second generation church, many times in its second generation stage, there are few conversions. A lot less conversions. I mean, we know the Lord, and that's fine, and that's good. And, and, uh, but, you know, we're not going to be fanatics like our parents once were. And so, 
I'm not going to pressure people. I don't want to pressure people and make them uncomfortable. By the time we get to the third generation stage of the church, they don't give opportunities for people to find the Lord. In fact, it's just sort of, well, you know, we want to just make sure that we're sinner friendly. You know, we just want to make sure that, that uh, you know, and so there's no challenge for repentance. There's no challenge for change. And so they never see anybody save. I mean, after all, people have to make up their own minds and, and we don't need to pressure people or make them uncomfortable. First generation church prayer life is strong. They love to pray. They love to pray with each other. They pray for each other. They lay hands on each other and pray and expect God to do great things. By the time we get to the second generational stage of the church, prayer is not as important. I mean, it's there and we believe in it, but it's, there's little prayer. By the time you get to the third generational stage of the church, I mean, there's virtually no prayer. It may be something read out of a book or, you know, they can drone out the, in the most monotone voice, the most powerful words of Scripture so that we end up with something like, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> First generation church, rich in the word of God. They love to read the Word. They love to bring their Bibles. They know that the preaching is going to be from the Word of God. They love to write notes, or if it's on their, their PD uh, or iPad or an iPod or whatever, but they love to read the Word and they connect with the Word of God. Second generation, less Word, little Word, carefully articulated so as not to be too convicting or too offensive. It's kind of a non-confrontational, non-offending kind of gospel, a sleepy uh, 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 grace, sloppy agape, I call it. By the time we get to the third generation church, in its third generational stage, there's virtually no word at all. People don't bring their Bibles or have it on their mobile device because it's not going to be about that anyway. And after all, the church is really, you know, the church is really an eclectic gathering of many different kinds of beliefs and many roads lead to heaven and and, and the Bible is filled with all of that offensive patriarchal language and the gay community doesn't like it and it's not politically correct and the feminists don't like it and after all it's not really inspired, it's the works of men and all those errant archaic concepts that are in the word. Let me tell you that philosophy is right out of the pit of hell. First generation church Listen now, it's about a personal experience with God. It is, a, it is an experiential God. And that's the reason in that first generation church that people connect emotionally and in every way. And they might, there might be tears that stream down faces. They might lift their hands. They, they might laugh or sing or because they connect with it's a personal experience with a personal God second chair church much more concerned about the programs of the church and how things look and the services that we offer to people and I mean first chair church they could care less about the the brand new crystal chandelier in the foyer of the church third generation Apathy, listen, apathy about eternal things. Oh, they may care about society and issues and political causes. They may march to save the blue whales or hug a tree, whatever. But in terms of eternal souls and concern for eternal souls, that's not so important. That is the pattern of declining faith. And I could show you the history of this throughout the Word of God. Let's just take two examples. Abraham sits in the first chair. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. Now people that sit in the first chair are not perfect people. They, God goes out of His way in almost embarrassing detail to expose their fractures and their failures. But when he got it right... He was a friend of God. 
And out of His faith comes a whole generation from whom would come the Messiah. And God fulfilled the promise through Abraham, who was a friend of God. Abraham and Sarah have a child. His name is Isaac. Was Isaac as committed and sold out to God as was his father Abraham? And the answer is no. He compromises over and over again. Serious compromises that hurts his family very deeply. And then we come to the third chair. And we have two boys by the name of Jacob and Esau. Two godly young men from the time they were children, right? Wrong. Jacob was a conniver and a deceiver until he got out-connived by his uncle uh, Laban and finally had a breakthrough with God. And if he hadn't had that breakthrough, his life would have ended in sorrow. Because his brother Esau, the Bible says in Hebrews, never repented. Though he saw it with tears, never repented. Jacob and Esau. Let's take another family lineage. Sitting in the first chair is a man by the name of David. David is a man after, what's the words? After God's own heart. Did David make mistakes? He did make mistakes, and it hurt him. But David loved God. He was a man after God's own heart, and God honors him for that. Sitting in the second chair is his son on the throne by the name of Solomon. Was Solomon as sold out and committed as was his father David? He was not. Did he compromise? He compromised so much that all those marriages was nothing more than an opportunity for, for one more treaty to be made with another ungodly nation. And so all of these wives represent treaties of ungodly nations. And he compromised. Sitting in the third chair is the third that is the grandson of David. Do you know what his name is? Rehoboam. The Bible says that Rehoboam was the most ungodly king that ever sat on the throne of Israel. His sin so divided the nation in two that they had civil war for generations of time because of the sin of Rehoboam. First chair, totally committed. Second chair, compromise. Third chair, calloused and not understanding or even knowing God. How many know this spiral downward, this gravitational downward pull on our faith? How many know we got trouble here? Yes. How many know God would never leave you without a solution? How many are ready for the solution? You ready for the solution? Yes. Turn to the New Testament and turn to another passage about three chairs. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And the amazing thing about this is that Something is handed down from generation to generation and it's not diluted. It's not lost. So listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Three generations. Sitting in the first chair is grandmother who? Lois. Lois. Who is sitting in the second chair? Eunice. Who sits in the third chair? Timothy. But the incredible thing about this faith, there is a faith that is recognized that endures the test of time. How is it that this faith endures through the third generation? Now listen to the word that is used in the Greek language for sometimes it's translated a sincere faith that is in you. Sometimes it's translated uh, with other words. I think the old King James word is unfeigned faith. There's no English equivalent for it. I don't know if there's a word in Mandarin or Cantonese or Tagalog. But I can tell you there is no English word. And because it's a Greek word, a very long Greek word, anupakritas is the way you pronounce it. Anupakritas. Anupakritas faith. 
It means undissembled. You can't break it into pieces. It is pure. It is unmixed. It is without pretension. It is without false appearances. A faith that has integrity as the opposite of disintegrity or disintegrate. This is a faith that holds together. It is a faith that doesn't disintegrate over time. And it is handed down from grandmother Lois to mother Eunice to grandson Timothy. How is it that Timothy escapes the gravitational pull? Does, is somehow he just doesn't have the temptations that others do? No, no. Paul many times admonishes Timothy. Timothy, don't give in to the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Timothy, don't disregard yourself because of your youth. Don't despise your youth. So no, he felt that gravitational downward pull. Well, then what are the keys? Three keys. Number one, first of all, it is a personal faith. In generation one, listen now, Lois has a personal experience with God. Second generation, Eunice has a personal experience with God. Third generation, Timothy has a personal experience with God. In other words, do you understand? Timothy could not just sit here in this third chair. He says, no, I can't sit in this third chair. In fact, he says, I can't sit in the second chair. I have to sit in the first chair and have my own personal experience with God. Some of you in this room, it could be that you know, you've been walking with Jesus since you were a child. It could be that your parents prayed the sinner's prayer with you when you were just a small child. But how many understand that you cannot live off of the experience of your parents? You have to have your own personal experience and relationship with God. You can't sit in the third chair. You can't sit in the second chair. You have to move up to the first chair. The second thing is that it has to be rekindled faith. And thirdly, it has to be a guarded faith. And Paul says in verse 14, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you and the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, remember the faith of your mother and your grandmother. And remember how I laid hands on you and anointed you and prayed for you. And your grandparents, your grandmother and your mother, they laid hands on you. And it stirred up something inside of you. That faith was rekindled. It was not left to devalue. It was not left to deteriorate. But that faith and the gifts that are within you, he says, they were stirred up. Because Timothy, you're going to lay hands on others. You're going to lay hands on faithful men and women of God who are going to lay hands on faithful men and women of God who are going to lay hands on faithful men and women of God, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, who are going to lay hands on Roscoe and Viva Burdett. Because that family lineage that I told you about, that's my family. Roscoe and Viva Burdett are my grandparents. And they lived a godly life but they knew that I was being raised in a home where my parents weren't walking with God. And so my grandparents would negotiate with my parents all winter long. So the moment school was out, they would drive 600 miles from Hannibal, Missouri to Detroit, Michigan. And there they would pick me up and they would take me down to Hannibal, Missouri. And there they would bathe me in prayer. And they would lay their hands on me and pray for me. And my grandmother and grandfather would take me to church and I'd watch as their hands would be lifted up and my grandfather, big tears just streaming down his face. And my grandmother, I would listen to her in the kitchen and she'd be washing dishes in the kitchen and she'd be talking to Jesus. And it was so real that when I was just a child, I remember sneaking around and looking to see if he was really in there. <laughs> and he was 
I just couldn't see him. And my grandfather, I can remember just like it was yesterday that he would take me down to the A&P store down the bottom of the hill. We would get groceries. He'd come back with a sack of groceries in one hand and me in the other, singing at the top of his lungs, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Grandpa, we're just supposed to sing that in church. No, son, there's always power in the blood. Amen. Unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's no wonder that age eight, when I was down there with my grandparents, that unfeigned faith, that faith of the first chair, that first generation faith was beckoning me to come up and sit in that first chair. Listen, this kind of anupakritas faith, it has the power to leap over the top of a generation and land on the third generation. And so at age eight, I accepted Christ. And then my grandmother, knowing that I'm not going to get that reinforced back at home, picked up the telephone and called the Brightmoor Tabernacle in Detroit and said, there's a boy who's accepted Jesus. Somebody needs to pick him up for Sunday school every Sunday morning. And so Jack and Joni Peppel drive up there in their Buick. And it was uh, the very first Sunday. It was raining and we didn't have a paved driveway. So I tramped through the mud and dragged my muddy feet into the back of their Buick. And they'd take me to church. And the interesting thing is that when my grandmother called the church, she called and made arrangements with the superintendent of the Sunday school, who if he knew who he was making arrangements for, his future son-in-law, <laughs> he would have sent me to the Baptist church down the street. But I'll tell you what happened. Years I went to church and I would pray with my Sunday school teachers and they'd always ask, what, do you have any prayer requests, boys? I'd be the first one with my hand up. What do you think my prayer request was? Pray for my mom and my dad. And so at age 13, my mother said, I'm not going to have somebody picking my kids up anymore. And at great risk, she got in the car with us and she started taking us boys to church and my mother came back to the Lord. And then finally my father persuaded him to come. We pray for him all the time. I was about 15 when he finally came to church because we were having a music presentation and I was involved in the music. And I'll never forget at the end of the music presentation, Bon Bowman, our pastor, gives an altar call. And we're all praying and I... I've got, I'm looking, I'm down here in the front, I'm looking, my dad's in the very back, I'm looking through my fingers. <laughs> and I watched as my dad, the first time that happened, I watched and my dad got up and I thought he's coming down to the front to give his heart to the Lord. And instead he walks into the aisle and he goes out the two back, there were two doors and I mean you could hear him as he hit those doors open and he went out and he got in the car and he revved up the engine and he started tooting the horn to assist us to get out there. We went home. He was so angry. He was mad at the dinner table. He was mad on Monday morning again. I didn't know they were going to do something like that, he said. He was mad on Tuesday. He was mad on Wednesday. He, was, he hated it so much that he had to come back just one more time to hate it again. <laughs> because God had a hook in his jaw and was reeling him in. He just didn't know it. And the second time he came and the altar call was given, my dad got up and he walked down that long aisle at Brightmoor Tabernacle and all my Sunday school teachers from all those years met my dad in the aisle and there was probably six guys that with their arms around him praying with him and today, my dad and my mother with the Lord, my children are today preaching Mark is preaching at a church in Alabama. My daughter and her husband ministering this morning in Michigan. And our grandkids, this is my family, the next one. Turn the next slide. That's my gang. And all of them know the Lord because of a first chair faith. Somebody sitting in the first chair.
And the question that I ask you as we close this message today is this. Come on. You know what I'm going to ask you. Which chair are you sitting in? Which chair are you sitting in? Are you sitting in the first chair? Or are you sitting in the second chair and you're just not, you've drifted. You just drifted. You're sitting in the third chair where they didn't know the Lord. Every person in this room, God loves you so much. So much. And you know where he wants you? He wants you in that first chair. Let's pray.